Let's take a look at our simple, our super simple model of the GDP again. Right. Now, this is a good model, not just because it is simple, mathematically speaking, but also it only rely on very, very weak assumptions. And actually, in fact, it didn't rely on any, uh, hardly any assumptions at all, right? Because remember how we started this? We started this with GDP equals GDP. That is a fact, right? That is simply an identity, right? And we apply other mathematical facts. We multiply by a one population over population. We move some things around and then we got that GDP equals population times per capita GDP. We do some more simple math, do a little bit of calculus, and then we got this equation, right? GDP growth rate equals population growth rate plus per capita GDP growth rate, right? Models that use weak assumptions or no assumptions at all right, are better. And they're better because they are paradoxically, they become stronger. They become stronger to critique and they, uh, because otherwise, because you don't have any assumptions that people can challenge. Right now, what we've shown here is that GDP growth rate, so again, this is the our proxy for living standard, right? Uh, and this is, you know, as long as we can keep this growing, we should be able to avoid any famine, right? Or any uh, diseases right, in, in the population. And this shows us that this is in both, right? Uh, population growth rate, okay? Now, this is key here because this, this is... Uh, contrary to what Malthus and Ehrlich is saying, right? Er, uh, Malthus and Ehrlich is saying that if your population growth rate increases, then the GDP, well, GDP growth rate will decrease, right? This shows the opposite of that, okay? And so GDP growth rate can be broken down into two components, population growth rate and per capita GDP growth rate. Now, per capita GDP growth rate, that is productivity per person. Okay. All right. Now we have mathematically shown that this is true. Okay. Now Malthus and Ehrlich could still be correct if there's a relationship between these two, meaning as population growth rate increases, per capita GDP growth rate have to decrease. Okay. So what this model shows that in order for Malthusian hypothesis to be true right, or to occur, then as population growth rate increases, per capita GDP growth rate must decrease. All right? Meaning that on average, people become less productive as population goes up. Okay? Now, I don't see any evidence of that is true. And here, right, we're starting to narrow down, you know, being rigorous and precise on why Malthus or Ehrlich or Thanos were wrong. Okay, let's look at some factors that influence these two variables that we are interested in. Okay? So population growth rate, I think it's pretty uh, intuitive. Right? Healthcare, Planned Parenthood, right? you decrease infant mortality right? or better medicine. Uh, people people uh, are not dying as young and people are living much longer lives. Right? Uh, now Planned Parenthood could have an opposite effect. Right? You could have, you could have uh, you know, decrease in population growth rate here. All right. Now, whether or not Planned Parenthood actually is a net positive or net negative in terms of population growth rates, um, you know, that we, we need a little bit more research to answer that question. But let's look at per capita GDP growth rate or productivity. Okay. Now, this is the story, right? Over the past 60 years, technological innovation. Okay. So we have more capital. Like we invest more capital, we invest more intellectual property, right? But you still need people to use it. So education of the labor force, right? All of you are here to be educated, to be able to use the capital, to be able to use the intellectual properties that have been invested, right? You are here because you, you want to become more productive, okay? Now, which one of these, right? Then which one of these uh, has a bigger impact on the overall GDP growth, Right over the past, you know, over the past, let's say, you know, let's say uh, 60, 50, 60 years. All right now, uh, well, let's look at some data. We can see if we can see if we can figure that out. All right, this goes back a little bit further than we need, but uh, I, uh, in my research, I came across uh, this data set, and I thought, you know, um, this is very, uh, this is very telling. 
And here, right, we have one of the uh, longest uh, time series data on GDP ever collected. This is in England. And but uh, most developed, you know, or even developing countries right, shows a similar pattern across across this time right, where you have for hundreds of years. Right, there's not much productivity increase. Right? And then, well, right, what happened in the 1800s? The industrial, the industrial revolution, and then that helps that help productivity a bit. But then here, what happened? Right, this is in the in the sixties, right? Which we'll talk about a major event uh, happening here. Right? Uh, and then, and then we have been growing exponentially since then. Right? Okay, so this is increasing capital stock and uh, increasing technological progress. So here we have some evidence that the growth in GDP right, is largely contributed to uh, GDP per GDP per capita. Okay? Even though around the, at the same time, right, population is still growing. Yeah? Although the rate, right, the rate has decreased uh, throughout this time. So population is still growing, but the population growth rate uh, have decreased. But yet GDP growth, the right, GDP uh, uh, growth rate uh, is increasing exponentially. Uh, here, I want to do. I want to show you uh, a research here, uh, and I think when we talk about GDP, uh, it's convenient, right? Money is a very convenient measure of productivity, but it's so convenient that I think we take it for granted of what it really means. Because at the end of the day, people work, people produce to trade, right? You do one activity, right? and the purpose of Producing something in the economy is to trade for other things in the economy. Right? Is to trade for trade for other products. Right? So I found this research, and I think it puts things in perspective. So basically, these are um, uh, hours of light right? equivalent to one modern light bulb. So like sixty watt, you know, like a maybe think think a sixty watt light bulb. That if you work sixty hours, okay, how many hours of light can get you? Okay? Now. 20,000 BC, right? So to calculate this, right, if you do just open fire, right? You you cut your, you know, you chop your wood, you build your fire, and you work for 60 hours, it gets you equivalently less than one hour of light. Now you of course you can have your fire. You know, if you work 60 hours, you have a fire that lasts much longer, but the intensity of the light is it's not uh, equivalent, right? So you have to you have to adjust for that. Right? Um all right, so this is not just total time of you know light burning, but this is but this is uh, keep in mind that this is also the adjusted for intensity of the light. Okay, all right, so you can look at this and you see the story here. Right, as technology progresses, as time progresses, right, for the same labor, like right, sixty hours of labor, right, for the same sixty hours of labor, you are getting exponentially more. By the way, this is log scale. So for those of you looking enough at um, uh, large data sets, right? uh, or, or if you remember from your algebra class, right? uh, when the reason why you need to do a log scale is because you have uh, extreme values, right? You have really extreme values, so you want to you want to um, just make sure things fit on a graph. Right, so you you do a log, and then you can so that you can fit this. What that means is when you see a log scale like this, right? You can, then uh, if this was not scaled, if if this graph was simply just the absolute uh, uh, absolute number hours of light, these would be off the chart, meaning that you would not be able to see this. Right? This would be just shoo, just off off the chart completely. Right? So they had to do a log scale, right? To to fit to to fit this on a graph. That's how productive, right? Uh, uh, we have become, right? right? And you can think, and you can imagine the the uh, um, uh, multiplier effect, right? With light, uh, now your workday become much longer. You can work, you can study, and you can study at night. You can study uh, all kinds of. Uh, you can study longer because you can read easier, and so on, and so on. Okay, so this is the argument for the traditional economists, right? And seeing data like that, I think they have a good they have a good argument. Right? Growth is unlimited. Right? 
focused member here, circular flow diagram, but where our focus is really just down here on the factor market. Okay? Investment in capital. Right, so manufacturing technology, investment in labor, education, right? And between capital and labor, right, remember the three, remember the three categories: land, labor, capital. But just between la between capital and labor, right? We and and through this, you know, and, and through this uh, um, a market market system, technological innovation will replace substitute will will replace resources, right? And will continue to grow, and the growth will be unlimited okay. okay all right now we've seen this before but i just want to show it here show it here again okay there's a major drop uh there's a major drop right around the 1960s okay and this is where the accomplishment right where we made tremendous gain in terms of avoiding famine okay and so this can be attributed to one uh single event here right the green revolution so let's take a look at this video here.